Okay, why don't we get started? I want to thank everybody for uh, coming this morning. We're really uh, honored to have uh, David Cass here from Johns Hopkins. <clears throat> David uh, is uh, from New York originally. He uh, attended college at Harvard where he got his BA in Applied Physics and Engineering, graduated summa cum laude and, and uh, Phi Beta Kappa, got his MD at Yale and then went to uh, George Washington University for residency in internal medicine and then was a fellow in cardiology at Johns Hopkins. He's been at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, since then. He started there in 1983. And he's now a professor of medicine, uh, biomedical engineering, pharmacology, and molecular sciences. He also has a number of leadership roles, including director of research in the division of cardiology, co-director of the cardiovascular research uh, T32, and director of the Institute of Cardioscience. He's had numerous uh, career awards, including election to the ASCI, uh, AAP, the American uh, Heart Association Established Investigator Award, and the AHA Basic uh, Science uh, Research Prize. He also uh, recently received uh, an Outstanding Investigator Award from the NHLBI, which uh, uh, comes along with uh, $600,000 a year for seven years <laughs> uh, to fund his research. So that's uh, more than an honorary uh, uh, designation there. Um, David has several patents uh, and is a co-founder of two startup companies, one uh, having to do with MRI technology and another with uh, nitric oxide therapeutics uh, uh, as related to myocardial disease. Um, he has a long list of, of trainees that's really Im impressive both for its length and uh, for the, uh, the achievements of, the, of his trainees. Many of them are in leadership roles both in the United States and, through, and, and throughout the world. He has more than uh, 400 peer-reviewed publications in uh, journals including Nature, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, PNAS, Circulation, Circulation Research, Journal of Biological Chemistry. His, interest, his research interests have been focused on uh, myocardial biology, uh, cardiac uh, hypertrophy, and heart failure, and he has uh, particularly been interested in developing novel therapies based on a, an understanding of the molecular pathophysiology. And I'd also like to thank David for helping me learn how to do a right heart cath once upon a time. <laughs> and I was a fellow at Johns Hopkins, and he was an assistant professor. So. David, welcome to the University of Washington. Thank you very, very much. So um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be back here. I was thinking um, about the last time I was in Seattle, and I, and I think uh, at that time, uh, data was actually still being stored on uh, five and a half, half inch uh, floppy disks. And um, as I said to someone earlier, uh, the, the, the Amazon was in South America. Um, so this place has changed, obviously. Uh, this is Riley. Uh, has changed uh, really tremendously. And it's great to be, uh, to be back and share, share some stuff. And the, the, the thing I'm going to talk about this morning um, is an area that uh, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I'm, I'm getting, I'm new to. I, I avoided the lungs, and um, nothing personal, but I avoided the lungs and the right heart most of my career and spent most of my time on the, the left heart and, and the systemic vasculature. Um, but I think there's um, not even growing. There's an appreciation that continues to be amplified uh, of, the, of the role of the right ventricle plays in determining so much morbidity and mortality in various forms of heart disease. Um, and, and the story that I'm going to tell you today is something that evolved at Hopkins specifically because um, at Hopkins, Fred Wigley, who runs a scleroderma clinic, which is really nationally known, has amassed a, a, a large um, group of people who focus on this syndrome. And therefore, we get a lot of patients with systemic sclerosis, and a lot of them are coming with pulmonary hypertension. And as we'll talk about, that's really, in the end, part of what this talk's going to be about. You would not know it from the title. Uh, it's one of the examples, I think a remarkable example, of where the RV loses. And we're beginning to understand how, what are the differences between how uh, some RVs can manage the hypertension that's imposed upon them by the pulmonary vascular disease that comes with pulmonary hypertension, and, and our other RVs can't. And can we actually now start coming up with new ways of treating this? Because frankly, we don't have a fucking clue what's, you know, what to do about this. No one's really treating RV heart failure specifically at this point. So I have no disclosures. 
Um, we'll start right off with, um, you know, the, 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 this is the type one, the sort of pulmonary artery hypertension, um, and the various ways in which you can get this. And what's important from this list is the, 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 the top two in, in terms of sort of generic categories where we see more of these patients are a, a group that will still, we'll still use the word idiopathic because we don't quite understand you know, what's causing it and we still see these patients for sure. Um, but one of the really largest uh, groups on this list is the connective tissue disease group um, for pulmonary hypertension. And, and of the connective tissue diseases that are associated with uh, pulmonary hypertension, scleroderma or systemic sclerosis leads the list by far. Um, and this is not that rare. I mean, if we ended up coming up with a drug in the end, when I finish the talk and I've convinced you this is something we need to be thinking about, um, and I've, I've, I've commented about this to some of the pharmaceutical companies, yeah, maybe it's going to be an orphan indication, but it's going to be like a lot of orphans. This is, this is, there are plenty of people with this. Um, the prevalence in the U.S. is between, this is a sort of disturbingly broad number. Um, tells you how, how precise we are, but, but some, let's say somewhere in 100,000 people. Um, in the middle. The, the annual in incidence is 19 uh, new patients out of every million. It is predominantly a disease in uh, females and sort of tragically in that sense, for that matter, it's young women in, in sort of mid-late childbearing years. This is, this is a disease that really hits women and hits them early in life. Um, and it's about, let's say, 10% of all the scleroderma patients are going to end up developing uh, pulmonary hypertension. So uh, again, this is not a small number of patients. Uh, in terms of the spectrum of diseases that can come along with uh, systemic sclerosis, the things that are most obvious are the cutaneous manifestations, the, the tight skin, um, the Raynaud's, the peripheral vascular disease, but there's also bowel insufficiency, abnormalities, and, um, and dysfunction. There's renal disease. Uh, pulmonary disease can be either the pulmonary hypertension or interstitial fibrosis. Um, and then there are forms of scler uh, systemic sclerosis that produce cardiomyositis. Um, importantly, the cause of death uh, with systemic sclerosis has been morphing. So back in the 70s, when if you were sitting there looking at these bars, um, most of these patients were actually um, dying because of uh, renal disease. And the, the renal disease has been gradually declining, but what's been uh, rising in the meantime is pulmonary disease, pulmonary fibrosis, and pulmonary hypertension, which now are really major causes of death uh, if you develop that particular uh, manifestation of systemic sclerosis. You can go to a typical Kaplan-Meier curve and appreciate that um, just over a four-year period, the percent survival patients diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension who have either, they have this idiopathic form um, versus uh, systemic sclerosis, PAH, and I'll abbreviate it this way for the talk. Um, they, they're, not, they're not doing very well. This is a 50% mortality at only uh, four years. Uh, and up until recently, in terms of how we're dealing with this really very morbid, very sick population when they get this, uh, it, we weren't terribly successful. Of late, there's movement to combine a couple of the key drugs to, together. It's sort of like cancer. You, you do combination therapy. Um, and there, we're beginning to see a flicker of ability to at least stave off the mortality. But in terms of any kind of underlying mechanisms and targeted understanding, what's really going on? Why are these people dying? What, what's the underlying mechanism? Um, that's really still, uh, we're, we're at the early stages of that, but that's what I'm going to talk about. So basically, you know, why is this happening? And I'll pose, you know, theory number one. Theory number one, which was the dominant theory when we started doing our work uh, a couple of years ago. And there's still people who like this theory, regardless of our data, um, so be it. The, that it's, this is basically a stiffness problem. And if you have the stiffness that's those obvious manifestations when we think of scler scleroderma on the skin and in other organs, but now think about it in the context of the pulmonary vasculature, someone who's got pulmonary hypertension, then that stiffness might be like the stiffness of arteries that comes with aging. There, you lose distensibility. That means that the pulse pressure in the pulmonary circuit is going to be higher. The pulsatile load that is imposed on the heart is going to be greater. That's a real load. That's a significant load. It may not manifest in the usual right heart calf measurements of mean output and mean pressures. Most of the time, we don't assess compliance of the vasculature when we do our right heart cats. We don't think about the pulsatile load. But it's known for a long time from the left heart work with, with 
studies like aging studies, that that imposes loads on hearts and makes it harder for them to actually be efficient. It makes them, it forces them to uh, consume more oxygen for the same cardiac output. It makes it harder for them to increase reserve capacity during exercise. So a lot of people, I think, were thinking it's all about what goes on in the lung. It's the load. And so in this case, the right heart just can't handle this load. And we need some other way to try to get at the lungs. So it's, it's important uh, to, to test this. As I said, in aging, where we knew a lot more about um, you know, stiffness and what happens, the, 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 this has been looked at quite a lot. And uh, I think just as a, as a cartoon review, you, you, you understand that um, in the arterial tree, systemic arterial tree, um, there really is kind of a dissociation, anatomic dissociation between the, the vessels that contribute to what we'll call the large vessel compliance. That's really what allows your pulse pressure to remain only around 40 millimeters of mercury, and it buffers the pulse, because this stretches, and this is where most of your elastic uh, vasculature resides. And as you get down to the smaller vessels, there is some smaller vessel compliance, but it's only about 20% of the overall arterial compliance. If I were to chop out, we did this years ago, actually, in a dog model with a very complicated uh, uh, surgery. We removed sort of this part of the aorta from the circulation and forced all the blood through a tube this way and back in again almost, I would say, 80% of arterial compliance disappears. So it, it, that, that's where it resides. Whereas the resistance is nowhere near here. It's all down here in the periphery in these much smaller vessels. So there's this anatomic dis dissociation, which means you can actually have disease here that doesn't really impact um, compliance, and you can have disease here, which really doesn't impact resistance. These things can, can be different. Uh, and then we also know that there are properties that are important with respect to the load on the heart that come with stiffness. One of these big ones is that when the pulse goes down and it reaches uh, the, the, down at the, the, re the regions of um, uh, increased resistance, sort of uh, what would be called impedance mismatch, where the vessels are narrowing, there's a pulse wave that goes backwards. It sort of bounces off. It's called reflected waves that now comes back up again. The stiffer this is, the faster it can travel. Therefore, it arrives sooner. And while the heart is still beating, the, the uh, reflected wave comes back and imposes on the pulse itself, making the load on the heart even higher. So the, the faster you can transit through this large comp uh, compliance tube, um, the more the uh, reflected waves uh, associated with the vascular stiffening are going to impact the load on the heart. And that produces hypertrophy and it contributes to cardiac dysfunction with aging ultimately elevation of load. So that's the systemic circulation. What about the lung? The lung is interesting. I, didn't, I don't know. I spent 30 some odd years of my, almost 30 some odd years of my professional career thinking about cardiovascular hemodynamics, and I never thought about this. But this, this is an old study, but it, it's very different. The, the proximal pulmonary artery really is not the source of um, the compliance of the pulmonary vasculature. It is really out in the periphery. You have to almost imagine, well, it, it is what it is. The lung is basically like an air-filled sponge. And you've got these, which means it's, these are compressible. All these little alveolar sacs that are full of air are much more easily compressible. You've got all these vessels moving throughout this air-filled sponge. What it means is that these, these vessels are not surrounded in some sort of a fluid-filled, incompressible material, which is essentially what the rest of the body looks like, whether it's skeletal muscle or any other organ. These things can stretch easily. And as the resistance is going up because the vessels are tapering, that's also where they can still distend. And the compliance and the resistance end up residing in exactly the same place. And it's pretty much in the periphery. And, and I think you're aware of the fact that how do we reduce resistance in the lung? We don't dilate vessels. It's not as, like what it is in the systemic side, where it's a, sort of an in-series you dilate and you reduce the resistance. It's basically a parallel circuit. You add clumps of perfusion zones. And as you add these things in parallel, that reduces the total resistance. And along with that, you build in more compliance. So it, it's quite different. And how do we know this? How, do, how can we re um, measure this sort of behavior and, and determine whether it's um, they're coupled or not. This is going to ultimately be our, this is almost, this is a little bit of math. In a way, this is the way my brain thought mostly when I was back in college. And it was sort of fun to come back to thinking like this again. Um, how we're going to prove whether it is or isn't stiffness of the artery. So, so he, this, is, this is a behavior that maybe this would seem surprising to you, maybe not. When I first saw this a number of years ago in a BME conference, I was sort of stunned, actually, because 
This does not happen in the systemic tree. But here we've plot simply pulmonary vascular resistance on the x-axis. This is from right heart cath data. A lot of patients, but a little over 1,000 patients um, from our database. And this is the, a, a sort of total pulmonary vascular compliance, relatively simple to um, measure from the stroke volume measurements from the thermo dilution and uh, pressure. And there's this you know, pretty tight inverse hyperbolic relationship. Which, which is telling you that there really is a sort of a codependence between what would be the resistance and the compliance. In fact, the, the equation for a hyperbola, you know, which is basically y equals 1 over x, means that if you multiply the x-coordinate times the y-coordinate, you're getting essentially a constant, that the product of the resistance times compliance is nearly constant. Well, that's exactly what you see in the lung. It is actually, this is the product of resistance times compliance. It's pretty constant. This, whatever the mean pressure, the, this, the, this really is very, fairly uh, narrow limits. This is the arterial side. It's all over the place. The, as I said, these are anatomically distinct parts of the body. There's no particular law that says that if your resistance is such and such a number, your compliance has to be this. But in the lung, because they're coupled tightly, um, you can't really get away from this range, this line. So that actually gave us a relatively interesting and simple way to start testing the idea of whether the lung is the source of the problem with these scleroderma patients. Before I do that, I just want to point out another man of, uh, sort of, I think, a clinical implication of, of this relationship, just a few more bits, because this, this is a, I think it was an interesting way of looking at the lung. So here's the curve. This is this sort of um, mean result from all these patients um, with this inverse dependence. As I've said, if the pulmonary vascular compliance is low, and that's what happens when patients have pulmonary hypertension, they're sitting out here, um, then the pulsatile load on the right heart is high. This is not, this is a load. This is a very much a big part of the load. And what, what, where we all are sitting in this room right now, I, I suspect or you're, you're down around here. And when you exercise, you, you actually move up here. So as your, resist, your resistance actually in the lung goes down as you add more circuits in parallel, and with that, your compliance goes up. And that's why your pulmonary pressures don't go sky high, even though you've just tripled your cardiac output. You can keep your pulmonary pressures in a very reasonable range. But pulmonary hypertension patients are sitting out here. And when they exercise, they're still sitting out here. And so that pulse pressure um, doesn't go away. The load doesn't go away. And it, it really limits, I think, what the right heart can do. And just to show a number of the, these are the positive trials for pulmonary hypertension with drugs. And here's the dot where the population started before we gave them the drug that's supposed to lower resistance. And what did, what did sildenafil achieve? Well, it got us up to here. We're nowhere close to where I think we actually need to be, where we'll really reduce RV load. Um, there's, here's the Diprostanil trial, and we, it was a little, these patients had a little higher uh, resistance to start with, and that's all we got. So in these, these trials, and the prostacycline trial got us, we're all back in here. So this is our success story, but this tells you sort of why we're having problems with this disease, even from the standpoint of pulmonary vasodilation, and really what we're confronting, because we want to be here. We definitely want to get down to sort of, this, is, this would be our cutoff for what we consider to be elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. We definitely want to be down in this zone. Um, so if it was stiffer, so here's now the sort of, I've given you kind of the axiom, now the math, now the math proposal. If in fact scleroderma produces stiffer vasculature, then compliance should be lower for any given resistance. We've got this hyperbola. We've got this relationship that tells us for a given resistance, this is what the compliance should be. And if it's going to be stiffer, it's got to fall below that. And so first question is, can this ever happen? And we actually looked at that in an early paper. I'll just show you one instance where the answer is yes, just so when I show you now that the other answer, you're, you don't, you're convinced that it can happen. This is what happens with heart failure when you have elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And the red basically represents a group of patients who had wedge pressures over 20 millimeters of mercury. And the, the um, ones that are basically uh, normal or low are in black. And yeah, it, it's, it's sort of, it's like the, the curve is trying to sit down. It, it, it's, it, and so its bottom is down in here and everything shifts lower. So this is an example of reduced compliance relative to resistance. 
And there's an next one. This is actually important for heart failure physiology, I think. This points out how changes on the left heart can actually impact the pulsatile load on the right heart, which was not something we were uh, thinking about uh, commonly, but, but it's quite true. Um, and I think it has to do with sort of reflections that are coming backwards from the left atrium with these high elevated pressures um, that influence the pulsatile load on the right. But I'm showing you this mostly to just convince you that um, it can happen. So we, we have this cohort of patients. We have 67 IPAH patients and uh, over 160 scleroderma patients. And when you look at most of the, the data um, from these patients to try to figure out you know, why one, uh, you know, is one stiffer than the other. Um, a, a lot of it, first of all, is, is no difference. Most of these p-values are, are no different. Uh, if anything, the scleroderma uh, population had slightly lower pulmonary pulse pressure, um, slightly lower diastolic and systolic pressures in the lung, not, not really higher. Um, mean resistance uh, was even a little bit less. Um, and total compliance appeared to be even a little bit higher. So that didn't bode well for this hypothesis. Um, and then, like, and then uh, we did the hyperbola thing. And the hyperbola thing is basically superimposing the data from our IPAH and the scleroderma patients. And it's exactly the same hyperbola that we had seen before. In fact, I could give you that curve from the thousand patients that we had done before. It's exactly the same curve. There's no difference between these. This is just a log representation where I can convert this into a straight line and then do simple regression statistics to ask, are they different? Um, they were not different. So our conclusion at this point was, nope, it's not the lung. It's not the stiffness of what, what might be going on in the lung. So that leads to theory number two. There aren't that many theories, right? So it's got to be the heart. So now what, what, what about the heart? So we took these same patients, we had the same cohort of patients, and we had done all these right heart cats that I taught Dave how to do years ago. And, um, and when you look at uh, the IPAH and the scleroderma PAH, this third group is scleroderma without PAH, just as a sort of a control. Um, here, um, uh, we don't, we're not seeing much difference in compliance or resistance in this, in this subpopulation. This is a somewhat different subpopulation because we, we're now going to do a whole new thing with them. Um, mean pressures were no different. Wedge pressures are no different. Not high, really. I mean, it's 10. Um, this is work, um, not significantly different. There's a fair amount of variance. Uh, clearly, if you don't have pulmonary hypertension, you have scleroderma. The, these numbers are all lower. But basically, standard stuff wasn't differentiating much. So um, some of you may know me from my early incarnation at Hopkins when I came in 83, and I was working with Sagawa Lab and got into bioengineering and sort of became for, I don't know, maybe a decade, kind of the, the PV loop guy, um, the person who did pressure volume loops in anything that moved. And, um, and so including, you know, dogs, rabbits, um, and then eventually mice, but certainly a lot in humans. Uh, I never did this in the right heart. I'm not actually doing the cats now. Uh, Ryan Tedford and now Steve Sue are really the ones who are doing it. But I sort of stand there and say, yes, this looks good. Um, but that's what we did. So we went back to an old technology. It's been around since I started my fellowship, this conductance catheter that you can put in patients. Um, we stuck it not in the left heart. I can't get a cartoon yet with it on this side, but pretend this is on the right heart. Um, it's going, it, we basically put it in through the neck. Um, it goes down into the right ventricle. It's got a pigtail, which sits at the apex. It's got a bunch of electrodes on it, which send out an alternating current. This thing functions basically like an AM radio. It's got a carrier frequency that it puts out. Um, it's, it, it's sensitive, the, the, what you measure as voltages on these electrodes, it's sensitive to the conductance of the material in between the electrodes. That's blood. And as the blood volume goes up, the conductance goes up. And as the blood volume goes down, the conductance goes down. So it's going at some frequency. I think the carrier frequency is 20 kilohertz. So you tune the amplifier to 20 kilohertz, you demodulate it, and you've got a, a volume waveform going up and down that tells you real-time volume. And that's what we do. And it works. You can get pressure volume loops of the right heart. This would be a normal right ventricle where you're filling and then, you know, early isovolumic contraction, which doesn't last long for the right ventricle. And actually pressure declines mostly during systole in the right heart. This is not something we see often on the left side. Um, and then you get your relaxation phase. So each one of these heartbeats would be going around like this. Uh, it's in all the textbooks now. And then this is what pulmonary hypertension looks like. And actually it looks like what 80-year-old people look like when you have a, you know, a, Systolic hypertension and a pulse pressure of 60, 70 millimeters of mercury going from 170 to 100 or something. It's the same shape. 
where you start your ejection and then you get this big whopping late increase in pressure, partially reflected waves and partially reduced compliance. So your peak pressure is almost always near end systole, whereas here it's really at the beginning of systole in the normal. And we can do this in both IPH and scleroderma. So the very first thing we did was to ask the question, is there a difference in contractility? Simple question. You can't, really hard to do when you've got very abnormal vascular load imposed on a ventricle unless you have the right tools. But PV loops are, are good for this. So this is from the paper um, a few years ago now. And you'll notice something odd. And this is the steady state beats for just uh, sample patients in each group. And then we did something and suddenly that like everything shifts up, what's going on? Um, to basically vary the load, which you need to do, you need to, to measure things like this, which is called the end systolic pressure volume relationship or elastance, which is a measure of chamber stiffness. You basically need to change the load. You, you, it's, it's like driving your car and you want to test things out. You don't just go at one speed. You push on the accelerator pedal. You lift off on the accelerator pedal. You imagine how it's behaving under this range of conditions and then you can get a better idea of good engine, bad engine. So this is, this is how we measure it. Um, and in, the, in my early years, I did this by putting a balloon catheter filled with carbon dioxide up someone's from the leg in their vein up to the heart, blow this balloon up basically occluded the inferior vena cava. And for a matter of beat to beat to beat, we could just watch on the screen and these pressure volume loops from the left heart would just, preload would go down and the pressure would go down and stroke volume would go down and we'd collect the whole shebang. Um, we're doing right heart caths now in patients. Everything's coming in from up here. I wasn't really so keen on going in from the legs simultaneously. No one even makes these balloon catheters anymore, um, which is unfortunate. So this is Valsalva. This is like a poor, poor person's um, uh, you know, IVC balloon. Hence, when you see the pressures rise, that's basically the intrathoracic pressure increase that happens when you do Valsalva. But as you know, as the phase of Valsalva, when you first initially increase intrathoracic pressure, right after that, you start reducing venous return. And beat to beat, you get the decline in venous return. So we were able to assess these relationships, contractile relationships. And I guess these are the prettiest loops I've ever seen in my life, but they're not bad, actually. For, for human data, this, this was pretty good. Um, and we could measure these relationships as well as diastolic relationships and calculate relaxation constants. It was, it was, a, it was really more of a, a comprehensive assessment of what's going on with these patients' uh, ventricular function, right ventricular function. And, um, well, I'm sorry, well, I'll show a summary of this, but one, one of the points here is that the, the slope of this line, these lines on these scleroderma patients, which would be contractility assessment, um, is less than it was with the IPAH. There was something was going on with contractility. It was not normal. These hearts may have appeared normal from all sorts of other routine um, metrics, but they're not normal. They're depressed. And, and simultaneously, um, what, we, what we found was that despite the depression of contractility, relaxation was, uh, was really not so abnormal. I mean, these, you know, these are all obviously not statistically significant. There's several different ways we measure the relaxation time constants. How fast does the pressure decay? This is an old metric that I remember Bob Bono first was developing in the 1980s or so when I was a resident. We were using this for looking at hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients with muggas. But a peak filling rate normalized to the end diastolic volume is certainly uh, not, not an uncommon metric and you know, no difference. So this will come back. Uh, the, the, there's a, the, when we get to the chapter of what's really going on in the myocardium, this was an important observation. Because not lots of things that produce depressed contractility and heart failure usually do it by affecting relaxation at the same time. Relaxation usually gets worse along with systolic contractility. These things are not commonly so dissociated. There's something going on here that stuck in the back of my mind for a while when we saw this that suggested this wasn't going to be garden variety mechanism. Um, and, and, we, and we ended up going to try to figure it out. So in the next study, um, this now uh, was Steve Sue, had, was a cardiology fellow, um, now just joined our faculty. He was working with um, Ryan Tedford, who had worked with me as a fellow, who is now on faculty. And um, we, we exercised these people. So now we have a patient with either of these syndromes, idiopathic or scleroderma associated PAH. They're coming to the cath lab. They're getting a right heart cath. After they get their right heart cath, they get this pressure volume loop catheter stuck in. We have a Y adapter sitting in their neck. So we actually have, we can put two things in. 
simultaneously. Um, after we get the steady state measurements, we put a pacing wire in and we paste the right ventricles. So the first set of data I'm now gonna show you is what happens when you increase the heart rate? What, what kind of reserve function is present? We call this force frequency dependence. The force frequency dependence for myocardium is known to be um, abnormal in many forms of heart, heart disease and heart failure, largely associated with um, inadequacies of calcium cycling, problems of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the ability of calcium to cycle. Um, and in which case your ability to enhance contractility with increased heart rate, which is a normal thing muscles supposed to do, um, becomes depressed. So how do these patients look there? And they were depressed. So here we are at baseline, where um, the, the, here we're using a, a deri first derivative of a pressure max sort of marker for contractile reserve. And then this one is a, a little more load normalized version of this, two different metrics. Um, they're starting at these regularly normal heart rates. We increase their heart rate to about 150. Um, the IPH patients are up here. The scleroderma patients are down here. They were significantly reduced. These patients do not have a normal response to heart rate. So there's uh, uh, something else going on, again, pointing to the muscle, pointing to the heart itself. Um, and then um, we looked at um, the di diastolic reserve with, um, at the beginning and at the end. So at a low heart rate and fast heart rate, here's the axis. And what we could see was that um, whereas um, the right ventricular end diastolic pressure would decline, which is what actually should happen as you increase heart rate normally, filling volume to the heart goes down, preload goes down. You don't have enough time in diastole for full filling. Diastolic pressures are supposed to go down. Uh, they were not, one did, but generally speaking, they did not go down. Um, in the scleroderma patients. So there was, a, there was a problem of sort of rate connected to the ability to uh, keep, keep your diastolic pressure in a, in a, in a good range um, at faster heart rates. That's a, a strange new term, keep your diastolic pressure in a good range. Um, but but the, so there were, there were rate problems in diastole and no, really notable problems of uh, functional reserve with heart rate in systole. So at peak exercise, next thing we did is we put them in a bike, all on the cath lab table. Now they're gonna have a conductance catheter in their right ventricle, we're measuring pressure volume loops. We took the other side of the Y adapter and put a, a swan. So they now have a four French uh, catheter sitting in their main PA and their legs are in the bike and they're gonna start biking and we're gonna monitor everything and see basically what do they do when they exercise? What's the right ventricular reserve capacity during exercise? Never been done before, like, not, not like this. Um, not, not a ton of people, but still the, the data is, you'll see is pretty uh, clear, I think. So um, here's basically how um, the, sort of their, their baseline functional characteristics were really pretty similar between the two groups in terms of their functional class, you know, their six minute walk uh, capacity, you know, where they were, they, 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 they both look sick. We're not, we're not cheating. Um, the scleroderma patients really could not exercise as much in terms of total time. The exercise data I'll show you will be at a matched time of exercise. They're reaching not perfect, but reasonable uh, respiratory exchange ratios. So we're, we're, they, they stopped it. They told us they have to stop each time. And we're doing like you usually do with an exercise test. There's, there's sort of, you know, keep going if you can keep going. We, want, we really wanted to get, I think, a good study out of it. Um, there's, a, there's a, only a borderline difference in peak oxygen consumption, which is interesting um, between the two groups. But um, in terms of the power achieved, clearly this, the scleroderma patients are, are depressed. So how did they do it? I'm gonna show you the punchline and then some mean data, but this is a patient without pulmonary hypertension. This is what's supposed to happen. So here's their right ventricular pressure volume loop. And this is at baseline. And now we're gonna go through stages of exercise, standard bike stages. And um, there would be a, an end systolic pressure volume relationship over here, which would be the contractility, which we would have measured at baseline. And there's another line that I'll, I'll point out over here that I haven't talked about yet. Um, which has a name, this, it, it, we, would, we would call it EA because it says EA, 
Um, but basically what it stands for is, this is an old engineering concept. It's basically the effective arterial elastance, which is an engineering sounding term. Um, what it really means is that it's an embodiment of the total ventricular afterload, sort of mathematically derived. It's, it's equal to nothing more than the end systolic pressure, which would represent the pressure at this point from the loop, divided by stroke volume. It's related directly to resistance times heart rate. The math is very simple. And there are lots of reviews on this now. There's, this is something you can find but maybe in, in Brownwalder. For all I know, Harrison's now. This is no longer a new, new idea. But it, this allows us to look at coupling, heart contractility to um, you know, sort of the uh, long pulmonary vascular coupling. And if this gets too high relative to this, then that's, that's a, that would be adverse coupling. That's so like high resistance, low contractility is exactly what happens in heart failure. Normally, this is, this is an disadvantageous for the pump in terms of its efficiency, its utilization of oxygen, how much work can it perform relative to its internal energy requirements. You want these things to basically be coupled. So we're gonna measure these things throughout. So here are the four loops that you get during exercise. This is normal. And um, there's a reduction in preload as the heart rate starts to kick up. But, there's the, but you increase or you, know, you maintain your stroke volume. I can tell you the heart rate overall is faster. So you're, you're zipping around these loops faster. And importantly, the loop is shifted upwards and to the left. So this is an increase in contractility. There's no way that you're on that same end systolic pressure volume relationship with those loops. They've, they've moved. Um, and uh, as I say, this, the, this is normal. We'll switch to this one. Okay, what happens to the IPAH patients? Well, they start off like this, and then they look like that. So the two things that are shown here, A, they look pretty much like normal. They show an increase in contractility, a little bit of a change in, in preload volume, not, not so much. I mean, it's, and, and actually, normally with exercise, this is supine exercise, which is a little different than when you're standing up. In terms of these volumes, they tend to not change so much. Um, but, but nonetheless, again, these, these, these patients are also zipping around faster, heart rate's gone up, and, and therefore they, they can put out more cardiac output. And you can judge by the, the relationship between these EA and EESs, these two slopes, that these things are still looking kind of like isosceles triangles. The, the angles are not so different. They're not skewed like this. So that means they're coupled. I mean, the slopes are more or less equal and opposite in order for those to take on that shape, more or less. Despite the changes in contractility, the change in load, and the increase in heart rate, these things are still largely matched. Opposite sign, one's negative, one's positive, but the slopes are similar. Okay, now what about scleroderma? Well, first of all, the slopes are very different to begin with, these two slopes. This is heart failure. I mean, this is high resistance, basically being posed, you know, net afterload from the lung versus a depressed contractility. And this is the real line. So the, li the lines are what we measured in these same people at, at rest when we started this. Okay. And how do, they, how do they get their output up? Well, they don't have any increase in contractility. It was, it was striking. They just dilate. But all they can do is use the Frank-Starling relationship. And they, they do that. So they increase their diastolic volumes. They increase diastolic pressures. They're able, they're zipping around faster they're, they're able to keep stroke volume um, essentially maintained compared to this by doing so. But basically, these are all falling on virtually the same end systolic pressure volume relationship. If I just had predicted from what we measured down in this direction what it would look like in the other direction, it's pretty close. So there's really no exertional contractile reserve in these hearts. And this is just now the sum summary data where you see increases in systolic contractility. That's the slope of EES. There's the EA, the, 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 the pulmonary load changes were the same in both groups, but the coupling is definitely worse in scleroderma compared to the IPH patients. And then in terms of the summary results for volumes, the end diastolic volume goes up substantially in the scleroderma group whereas it remains essentially unchanged from baseline and, and systolic volume goes up. So these are very different responses to exercise. And then not surprisingly, right ventricular ejection fraction declines with exercise at the same exercise stage, whereas in the other group, um, it's maintained. So at this point, we, we've, we've now defined sort of from my title, an example of an RV 
facing a pulmonary load where the RV loses. There's something very profoundly abnormal. And you wouldn't have known it from rest. We don't measure function of ventricles much during these kinds of reserve maneuvers routinely. And yet, having done so, we've, uh, we've basically revealed a, a fundamental abnormality that's going on. Okay, so, so in the last little bit now, you know, why? I, I, I ask whys a lot. So, you know, why, why is this happening? So what's wrong with these hearts? And um, as I re recall, I said originally, one of the things I noticed from the in vivo data that I thought was interesting was the fact that there was this systolic defect that really wasn't paralleled by the same kind of diastolic defect. And if this was the usual kind of thing I see with heart failure, they're, they're coupled. The one part of way, way things can go wrong, where you might see this, is actually when it's a sarcomeric defect, when there's a problem of the myofilament calcium force dependence at the level of the sarcomere. Because when you do that, it is possible to affect more systole than diastole, or more diastole than systole. These, these can start to get dissociated more easily than it does when it has to do with calcium. So this has been looked at only once before, and just to set the stage so you know what, what we're looking at here, um, this is a, um, this was probably done in muscle. Um, from, this was from explant, oops, I can't walk that far. This is from explanted um, uh, hearts in patients who had chronic pulmonary hypertension. A lot of the patients had congenital heart disease, which Eisenmangers is often pretty compensatory for a long time. It's not exactly the same thing as what we're looking at. None of them had scleroderma. Um, I think three had IPAH. But the, but the data that they're showing here is what you would get if you took this preparation of, of muscle, or where I'm going to do it with a, an isolated muscle cell, because I'm going to do it from a biopsy. Uh, and you chemically skin it, so you effectively perforate the membrane in this, this sort of a, a mild detergent and uh, in zero calcium. And then you gradually increase calcium concentration in the bath. You can't stimulate it anymore. It's not going to be electrically activatable because the, 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 the membrane's porous. So you can't have a voltage gradient or anything. But you can now increase calcium concentration inside the muscle or the cell, and that's what's shown here in a log scale. And as you do that, you measure the tension. And you get this sigmoidal shaped curve where this is maximal force. The, this would be the 50% maximal or activating calcium concentration. And then this would be sort of the diastolic range of calcium and, and calcium and force. And you know, what's apparent from this and this one prior published paper is it looks like it's up. These, these particular group of patients with pulmonary hypertension, mostly congenital heart disease, seem to have enhanced sarcomere response to calcium. It's not going to be easy to, if this is true in scleroderma, we're in trouble. We, this, this, would, this would be uh, the wrong direction. But nonetheless, this is all we went on. This is all we had. Um, so the first thing we did in, in our study, we biopsied the same patients. So a lot of these patients now have gotten right heart biopsies. Um, we looked at their histology, and we did see a little bit of increased fibrosis. This is, you know, within the limitations of what you're going to get from an endomyocardial biopsy and all the sampling error that goes with poking around the endocardium of the right ventricle and grabbing a tiny spot, it still came out a little bit more. Um, but interestingly, regardless of whether there was more fibrosis or not, when we measure isolated myocytes from these biopsies and look at the tension, so this is now just sarcomere length tension of, of, the, of, these, of a skinned myocyte. Can't, we have to do this in skin cells. It's stiffer. They are somewhat stiffer than what would be a control group. The controls, by the way, are donors that we get through a collaboration with uh, Ken Margulies at Penn, and it's from the RV septum, so we're matching the same part of the anatomy. Um, so there is a little bit, but this doesn't differentiate these two groups. This is not the diastole thing. They look, they look about the same. What about the systolic force calcium dependence? Well, here the results were remarkable. This was just published um, a month or so ago in circulation. Um, so here's the same kind of curve. Here's tension calcium. And as we increase calcium, again, with a log scale, we go through that um, the, 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 the steep portion where you get cooperativity and you get increased tension with relatively small calcium change. And you can see the control group here is halfway in between patients with IPAH, which indeed looks like the prior data published. But the scleroderma patients are the exact opposite. They're, they're very depressed. They've really got a, a problem, particularly in the high level of what would be systolic calcium. 
and um, max, this what we'll call F max, maximal force. Um, and if you normalize the data to the peak, so you make all of these the same at one, then you can also appreciate, which would be hard to see here, that there is a little bit of a um, sensitization, actually shifts to the left in the, um, uh, the patients who have scleroderma PAH. And if, if this was all that was happening and there wasn't this, then this would actually be sensitized to calcium because for the same calcium, when plotted normalized, the scleroderma patients actually are generating more force. But because of the profound reduction in the peak overall, in that range, there's really no difference. But at higher calciums, it's very much reduced force. Now, what makes this even more interesting to me is that we got a group of patients who have systemic sclerosis, dyspnea. That's why they came to the cath lab. That's how they got referred to the pulmonary group. But they didn't have pulmonary hypertension. So at least not at rest. They have sort of exercise-induced pulmonary hypertension. And maybe now, I think the group just met in Europe and they're redefining everything. Maybe now they would technically will have pulmonary hypertension. But this, was, this would have not been, these patients are not being treated at the minimum. This is not considered clinically indicated for treatment for pulmonary hypertension group. They do have scleroderma. And they're abnormal. They're, the, the controls are here. Our SSCPH are here. They're sort of intermediate. This, this stuff that's going on in the right heart, even if it's intermittent pulmonary hypertension. So this is scleroderma, I think. We can't get pure scleroderma with nothing. They don't come to the cath lab. I, I can't biopsy patients who have no indication to get them into a right heart cath, at least not yet. Um, I'd love it to find out because I, you know, I, I, I do appreciate that this, this, you know, the disease itself is sort of a microvascular inflammatory disease, something going on in the heart that we might be able to indeed detect even in scleroderma alone. But it, this suggests that, that these, this, this is a group that we're not currently doing anything with that actually have an underlying heart problem that's evolving. And if we can intervene early and start thinking about doing something, maybe we'll actually stave off the development of the disease to the point where we now have 50% four-year mortality. I mean, this is, I think, a very optimistic spin with the idea that we're seeing something early on that we didn't know exists. Um, do we see this kind of reduction of Fmax anywhere else? And the answer is yes. This is uh, what happens after an MI. Um, this is a, an animal model where this was looked at some years ago by Peter Detome. But here's the, it looks very sort of similar to scleroderma. And we, we're wondering right now, is this sort of a, an effect of an ischemic-like environment or ischemia reperfusion injury because of the vasculitic and inflammatory process, whatever scleroderma really is? Um, at that level, and, and there, are, there are things that are now part of the next set of grants to try to sort this out. Um, this is an example of what happens with, uh, in, um, with LVADs pre and post ischemia, um, where we see similarly this kind of, uh, this sort of shift that occurs uh, in the case of uh, ischemic disease. And there again, there, there are some proteins that have been identified. These are old studies. But yes, we, we can see this in humans. Um, another example, though, another mechanism that may not be post-translational is something my, my own lab put out a few years ago that you may or may not have seen, but it's sort of an interesting concept. Um, and for, forget about uh, what PETA is for a moment, but just we'll, we'll look at, I mean, here's this curve, which is heart failure, and here's this curve, which is um, normal. This happens to be from dog data uh, with, a, with a tacky pacing model in dogs. Um, and what was interesting is that the explanation for why this looks to be depressed is not so much because everything's abnormal in some level, something's truncated, something is cleaved, something's not phosphorylated, that kind of thing. But actually, my analogy here is this is more like, you know, when, when you're a failing heart and you're trying to, you have to get bigger, you have to hypertrophy, you have to enlarge, you need more sarcomeres, and you're trying to basically put an addition on your house in the middle of a class five hurricane, which is the equivalent of all the neurohormonal stimulation and mechanical load that's being imposed in the heart. Guess what? It doesn't come out so well. And you end up with a bunch of myofibrils that are really pretty cruddy. 
And we looked for this, and in this study, and feel free to, I'm not going to show much data from it, it's its, it's, a, it's, its own talk, but it was fascinating that the, the percent decline in, in this that we saw in this model correlated with the disorganization of the same percent of sarcomeres. This is from electron microscopy, where you're looking at normal sarcomere structure with the Z disks and the M band, and, and you could see how um, this could become very disorganized and kind of wavy. The folks who did this were completely blinded as to what they were you know, looking at in terms of what the source material was. They referred to this as sort of uh, wavy. They like the wavy term. But the Z disks where the, where the actin proteins normally anchor are, are kind of dissociated. Um, and it turned out that this was the same sort of percent decline. So I think that's another thing we have to look at in scleroderma. This may be a disease that's trying to adapt to pulmonary hypertension, and the fundamental process is it can't, it can't hypertrophy normally. It can't build healthy sarcomeres, and some of them are going to be lousy. And when you have a certain enough percent of lousy sarcomeres, your force capacity goes down, and that affects your systolic function. Um, and that, that, that's possible. I'm going to actually skip this slide. I want to get to the the correlation with uh, global, and I'll, I'll end it. So this, this, is the, um, this is also from the paper where we, we basically ask the question, what's the relationship, such as we can do, between the sarcomere stuff? So we, we measured that, patent, that maximal force, calcium force, and in vivo measurements. So this is contractility of the heart of the same patient measured in the, in, in the cath lab versus Fmax, and there was a positive correlation. And there was even a more seemingly tighter kind of negative correlation between what I showed you is um, the, the, the RVs dilate. The end diastolic volume gets larger in the scleroderma patients when they exercise. So this is the percent uh, change in diastolic volume. The scleroderma folks would be up here and the IPH would be down here. And this also correlated to that same sarcomeric function from the same patient's biopsy. So you're going from cell and cell-mediated sarcomere function to some sort of integrated physiology in the lab. Um, what about how we might treat this? So there are classes of drugs that are, attempt to reverse myofilament desensitization problems. Um, this was an example of, of, of one of these drugs used in a mouse model, first developed by Ann Murphy at Hopkins, where she mutated uh, the protein called troponin I to mimic what was thought to happen in stunned myocardium, ischemic reperfusion injury. And in stunned myocardium, this is working with, she did with Eduardo Marban initially, there's evidence that the, um, there's a proteolytic uh, piece of the protein in the C-terminus that comes off, it gets truncated. And then when that happens, you get this systolic depression. She created a mouse that's simply a transgenic mouse that expressed this truncated version. So it has an abnormal troponin I that's missing this piece that otherwise was being cleaved off by actually a, a protease called calpane. And when she did that, sure enough, similar kind of calcium transients, that's not the problem, but the force was very depressed. So she produced this. And then some years later, working together, uh, Ann and I tested a drug that had been developed by uh, Emerc that is a calcium sensitizer called, uh, I guess on, and this we're just calling it EMD, it's EMD 57033. And what was interesting to me is that when you give this calcium sensitizer to a normal heart, the shift in contractility, the improvement, this sort of leftward shift was fairly modest. But when you give it to a heart whose primary problem is desensitization, you got a really large effect. This is the transgenic mouse that would represent the sort of stunned myocardium model. So there are drugs that are being developed that can do this. Um, right now, Amgen is in the process of a phase three clinical trial of a drug called omacamptiv macarbal, which is a myosin ATPase activator that they had screened for some years ago that basically is a calcium sensitizer. And it's, and it's in, in the most generic sense of that term. It increases force without changing calcium. And it does it by increasing the probability that the cross bridge will end up in a highly bound cross bridge force generating state. Uh, we'll find out in another, I guess, another year how this worked out for the phase three clinical trial. But they've also got other drugs. There are other ways to do this, including troponin activators, other ways to modify the, the myofilament. Um, if it turns out that this is kind of microvascular ischemia, 
of the heart, of the right ventricle in these patients, then there may be other avenues. Maybe it's going to be more on the angiogenesis side. Maybe it's some things that cancer people have been playing with in terms of signaling to try to enhance perfusion of the heart. We don't want to stimulate it to contract without fixing that. We'll make it, we'll make it worse. But we need to do something to then improve the balance. So as we're pursuing now some of the mechanisms of really trying to understand why these curves are different, I think there may be some therapeutic approaches and perhaps the first sort of precision guided therapy for what is otherwise a very lethal disease where the, where the RV failed. So my final slide of take home message is not all pH morbidity and mortality is really due to the lung. That how the RV is able to respond, it makes a big difference. That systemic sclerosis is a particular issue, uh, example, I think, of a failure of the RV to be able to adapt to this high load. And it sort of ends up being a bit surprising, at least to me. I mean, if this was a multiple choice question from the very beginning of the talk, here are these two groups of PAH patients and one dies and one you know, isn't dying. And you know, what's the likely explanation? And choice C was it's a primary defect of the sarcomere of the right ventricle. That probably wouldn't have been your first choice. But it looks like it's, you know, the primary defect of the right ventricle is really quite important. Um, and uh, I think it, it, it's, it seems to correlate with their exercise reserve mechanisms. And we don't know whether it happens with SSC alone yet. And I think we need to start paying more attention to the RV and trying to come up with therapeutic targets that really can fix it. So I, I didn't, I, I apologize, I didn't show their pictures. I realized this this morning, but I'll recognize them by name. So Steve Sue is now a junior faculty in heart failure at Hopkins and had worked with me actually as a medical student, then he was a resident in Hopkins, he's a lifer, um, and then a cardiology fellow and just joined the heart failure group. Ryan Tedford trained with me also as a heart failure um, fellow and then was on faculty and unfortunately decided to leave us recently and is now in the, the medical college of uh, in, in Charleston, South Carolina. Jonathan Kirk um, was, a, was a postdoc in my lab, now an assistant professor at Loyola and really pioneered the work on the myofilament assay and getting this up and running and, and, and doing some of the initial biopsy um, studies. Anita's our study nurse and others on the pulmonary team, in particular Paul Hassoon, who runs the pulmonary hypertension service at, at Hopkins and Fred Wigley, who runs the scleroderma service. And I'll stop here and take questions. Thanks. Yeah. That's a great, a great talk. I mean, I just been kind of thinking in a different direction. You've got these really sophisticated ways to look at the right ventricle and its response to changing loading conditions. Is it, can you use that to predict which patients with pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular dysfunction who are undergoing a procedure that will change their pulmonary vasculature will recover? So like the patient with congenital heart disease, the patient with mitral valve disease, and a big problem we face clinically is that patient has an RV that doesn't work, but we don't know if when we replace the mitral valve, the RV is suddenly going to work again because you've taken away the load, or if the RV is going to stay big and dysfunctional. Can we, can we count? Right. Um, I mean, the, the, yeah. So, yeah, I think this, the short answer is yes. I mean, I think that's one of the things that um, pressure volume relationships, even back in the early 80s with this guy, Mark Sterling, who was asking the question purely on the left ventricle, where you have chronic mitral regurge and LVs that ideally look better than they really are and how much better are they than they really are. And if you fix the unloading from the regurge and suddenly you're going to load the ventricle in that case, um, is the ventricle going to be able to do it? And that's actually one of the early uses of PV relations, an effort to use that to calculate what is the intrinsic contractility up front to give you an idea. Is this, is a, is this really underlying a weak heart that's going to have trouble with this load or a stronger heart that's going to be perfectly fine with this load? And what you're asking is sort of the analogous question. If we can, can we model can we take a set, a set of PV loop measurements at rest at one condition and then start asking, assuming nothing else changed, which it might, but assuming nothing else changed, what happens if we just did this or, or that? And I can tell you there, uh, you may or may not know this um, model, but this is available uh, right now still largely, I think, on an iPad. Um, but Dan Burkhoff, who was a PhD student when I was at, first came to Hopkins, um, has, has made something called Harvey. Um, which is, with an eye, um, which is a very sophisticated cardiovascular simulation program, which allows you to do exactly what you're contemplating. If you have a number, if you have a bunch of parameters that you can fit in, 
from some baseline measurement condition, let's say, of a given patient, you can manipulate estimated uh, regurg of a valve on the other side of the heart. It has valves, it has pressures, and you can, you can modify rate, heart rate, peripheral load, comply, anything you want. And it'll recalculate essentially for you what's going to happen, what, what, what would be the cardiac output. What, so it, it, and it, it, it's set up to do all sorts of things with and not just um, valve lesions and other stuff, but um, uh, you know, um, what we call it ECMO and, and, and various forms of assist. So yes, I think that, that, that this is doable. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep my answer short. Yes. Well, so two things. The, 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 I'll, I'll make it real fast. But the, the, so the calcium data that I'm showing you is completely uh, dissociated from whatever would be going in the matrix because it's an isolated skinned myocyte. Right. 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 It's been working. It's adapted to that over time, right? It's been in that environment before you skinned it to that. Yeah. Although, yeah. Although there are, so, um, do I think that increasing the sort of interstitial load or viscoelastic load on a myocyte will over time result in myofilament calcium desensitization? Um, personally, uh, no, I don't think so. But I'm not, I mean, I, and I don't know, I would say that only because I can't come up with an immediate study or example in my head where that, the primary issue was, you know, that we created a lot of fibrosis and that the and then when we looked at the isolated myocytes that came from that fibrotic heart, we found out that there's something very wrong now with the sarcomeres that decide to, because generally speaking, if anything, it's going to be a pro, it's sort of a hypertrophic stimulus. It's not, you don't, you don't poop out because of the, it's another form of load, right? But um, so I, 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 I don't think so. I mean, the, the, the thing about the, 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 um, the other thing about the fibrosis is that while percent-wise we see it, this is not a lot. It, and um, it also has been shown to be kind of regionally distributed. So from just autopsy specimens of scleroderma hearts, I think we were in the perfect sweet spot because it's often more subendocardium than elsewhere in the muscle. So I, again, I, don't, I think we're seeing not just the tip of the iceberg, but actually more like the base of the iceberg. The tip is probably less. And the fact that the cell stiffness, which I, I skipped over, but we, we have some explanations for that with protein kinase A, is really identical. And that still is much more of really what goes into diastolic tone and, and stiffness. And I didn't point out, but actually from the chamber measurements, our chamber measurements, we really aren't seeing at the chamber level where the fibrosis is in there, that these are really stiffer hearts. Um, no, so I, I, my, my, you know, I, for all the reasons, I know people focused on diastole for this, and, and we see this, but to me, it's more systolic reserve dysfunction at the, and, and with the sarcomere playing a big role. Well, great. Thank you very much, David, for a real inspiring talk. Thanks.